Well, as we sing our intro, number near of your heart because there O oh God sin cannot molest us so as we gather in this place O oh God to serve you we pray O oh Father for your presence and your spirit to be with us and in us so we can offer unto you Lord a righteous service I pray this in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Happy Sabbath. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Uh, I hope everybody's well. And everybody survived the heat on Tuesday. I say to somebody, I've never experienced so much heat in my life. And they said, I thought you were from Africa. I said, I'm from Africa, but I've never experienced that. You know, the African heat is very different. When you sit outside, you get breeze. Every time I went outside, I got like steam from the boiling kettle on my face. It was just, and uh, I said, well, the Lord is good anyhow. And we keep on praising him. I would like to welcome everybody to church this morning. It's good to see everybody. We've got a few visitors and only two are in the book of uh, visitors' book. We've got Sister Myla, all the way from Ukraine. What does the church say? Amen. Amen. Sister Myla is uh, visiting from Ukraine. And she's not alone. She was brought to church, I was told, by Brother Jim, who is from Leeds. What does the church say? Amen. We'd like to welcome you too. And I'm sure Sister Myla will be a regular member. <laughs> and Brother Jim, please come back again. Amen. Um, I've got a few announcements. Um, I haven't seen Sister Norma. I was going to call her, but I will do the, the reading as well. The first reading of the transfer of names. The first announcement is the NEC will be running a biblical exegesis, whatever that is, <laughs> training course. And um, it's about the lay preaching, lay preachers who are interested in attending this online training. Please contact elders or pastor um, uh, for you to take part in this uh, training. And the second one is Vocational Bible uh, School is running from the 1st of August uh, to the 1st of August to the 5th of August for children aged 5 to 14. Those who've got children who they want to take part in Vocational Bible 
Bible school is running from the 1st of August to the 5th of August. For the group aged five, five years to 14 years old. And then the children aged five years are welcome, under five, under five years are welcome, but they need to be accompanied by an adult. If your child is under five, they need to be accompanied by an adult. If you want further details, see the children's ministries department, please. Uh, the third announcement, the NEC Adventurer and Pathfinders Fair will be on Sunday, the 14th of August this year. Sunday, the 14th of August. Families and friends are invited to join us in this run. Um, and the praise team, please, um, there will be a workshop on the 30th of July at 3 o'clock. 30th of July, Sister Jean will run a workshop for the praise and worship team. Please see Sister Jean for any details if you want to join this workshop. And I will do the first reading of the membership transfer of Brother Jose Martins who's transferring his name from Lisbon Seventh-day Adventist Church to Leeds, Seventh, Leeds Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is the first reading. And the church, first reading again of the church official, um, the name of Sister Carol Dempster uh, as an assistant Sabbath school superintendent. Sister Carol Dempster as the superintendent is assistant superintendent, Sabbath school superintendent. This is also the first reading, the second reading, and the vote will be done next week. And I take this opportunity to also promote the family life camp that is taking part uh, in August. I will tell you what date. <coughs> I get so mixed up in this thing. I need to tell you the exact date so that you don't blame me later for me. I think the bookings are done, but um, I think they are still taking any phone calls. The last booking date was the 15th, I think, of this month, but if there are still spaces, they can still take your booking. The retreat... me or any of the family life group, uh, team group. Thank you. I would like to also welcome those who are watching online. Please feel welcome and we welcome everybody once again. Let us stand and open our, s our worship with hymn number 608, 608. Right, and press the battle ever. 
Salvation amid on each trip with truth all good above. Let all tremble beneath the thread and echo with a shout. Faith is the victory. say no matter how much you come up here, you get nervous every time you step up here. It's nerve-wracking. I forgot to introduce the platform party. On my right is Sister Yvonne. I always say your surname is a tongue twister. But it doesn't matter. I helped her with another difficult name so she will understand. Uh, and behind me is uh, Elder Watson who is going to break the bread of life today, and Elder Nkomo is on my left, is a serving elder, the two are serving elders in this church this morning, for the benefit of our, our visitors, amen. Good morning, church. I'm Yvonne. Yvonne Opwebi. Is that difficult? <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm doing the garden of prayer this morning. And I'd like to take this uh, privilege of welcoming our friends from Ukraine. I hope you'll be blessed, and all our visitors. I know you've been welcomed before, but yes, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome you once again. I'm going to do the Garden of Prayer, and there are three families that we'd like to pray for. Um, the Baptist family, Ron and his family. Can you come forward, please? And then Sister Dempster and her family. Can you come forward, Carol, please? And um, now I'm in the same position Colette was in, because I've got an East African name here to pronounce. I'll try. Um, I'll call Banda. Is Alice here? Alice Banda and her husband. Now, in English, it's Nobizita Mla. M Ma, ma, mala. mala, mala, but but in to pronounce it the East African way, I need to click, click. <laughs> so yeah. it's nobizita, <laughs> nobizita. <laughs> so we are going to pray. Um, can you come forward, please? And um, if the church, I'd invite the church to kneel where you can, and I'll come down. 
So, but you won't be able to hear me if I do. I'll stay here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again on this beautiful Sabbath day to glorify your name. Heavenly Father, we are so privileged because we serve a God who is awesome. Father, you are the God who created not just this earth, but the entire universe. You own the entire universe, Lord. You made the stars, you made the sun, you made the moon. Father, you made us. Heavenly Father, you have your mighty army. There is nothing for you, Heavenly Father. There's nothing that can destroy you. Father, we come to worship you because you're a God full of love, full of forgiveness, full of mercy, full of grace. Heavenly Father, we are so privileged to have such a person who protects us, who loves us, who wants to take care of us, who offers us so much of love. Heavenly Father, you're a God of love. Love pours out of you. And so, Father, we accept that love this morning. We accept your grace. We accept your graciousness. We accept your mercy. We accept your magnitude. And Father, above all, we accept our position as children of the mighty God, because you have asked us to call you our Father. And so this morning, we say, our Father, we come to you with our petitions. Father, I'd like to bring to you the three families here present, the Baptist family. Heavenly Father, Ron and his children are here, his two boys are here. And Father, you have asked us as parents to guide these children. You say we should carry your words with us. We should write them on tablets, keep them on eyelets in front of our eyes, bind them on our arms, talk to them constantly in the way as we are bringing these children up. Father, I pray you'll give Ron that wisdom, Lord, and the ability to guide these children. And Father, you've said that children obey your parents in the Lord because this is the first commandment with promise. And fathers, provoke not your children. So Lord, I pray for Ron's family that as he continues to show love to his two boys, Father, we see him every week and the love and the care and the protection he's giving to his sons. Father, may it long continue. Father, may, be, may they follow their father in the word, the guiding steps that he's showing them. May they learn to love you, Lord, and love your word. The family said that your word is sweeter than honeycomb. Father, may that be their experience, that they'll wake up every morning to want to hear the word of God. Bless them, Father. Keep them. Unite them as a family and let them stand, Lord, on that great day together as a family because you have kept them together. Father, I pray for Carol. Father, you see how much she loves you. You see her desire to serve you. You see her eagerness, Lord, to proclaim your word. Father, please continue to bless her, to give her your wisdom. Be with her family, Lord, because that's a burden she carries heavy on her heart, her children and her grandchildren. Father, I pray for them, Lord, that you will open their spiritual eyes, that they can see that there's nothing in this world that is so important as saving their souls. For what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So, Father, please, I pray for Carol and her children. Father, I pray for Alice and her husband. Father, they're a newlywed couple. So, Father, I ask you to look down on them in love. Father, you have said that a good wife is from the Lord. And we are thanking you on behalf of Alice's husband.
that you have given him a good wife. Father, a good husband is a blessing from the Lord, the head of the house. And Father, we thank you for this husband that Alice has chosen. Heavenly Father, you have brought them together. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. So Father, we are praying for constant unity in this family, for love in this family. Father, we ask that you bless the fruit of the womb, that you'll give to them the children they desire to have, and that they will be children that will bring joy and not sorrow. Father, as a young married couple, Father, we know how difficult it is because we've done that before. So Father, I ask that you provide for them spiritual benefits, as well as physical benefits, material benefits, financial benefits. Bless them, O oh Lord, I pray. And Father, for the congregation, wherever two or three are gathered, Lord, your presence is there. And we are the temple of God. So Father, there are so many temples of God sitting in this building this morning. Father, indwell each and every temple that is bowed down before you this morning. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to indwell in every single temple. Father, whatever that is not of you, remove it from the temple, Lord. Cleanse the temple. Cleanse these temples of our holy bodies and let your Holy Spirit sit and dwell with us. Heavenly Father, there are so many petitions that we have to ask of you this morning. But Father, we want to give you thanks because you are the God of grace. You said if you were hungry, you would not tell us because the sheep on a thousand hills belong to you. So Father, we know that as children, we are already provided for. We might not see it with our natural eyes, Lord, but open our spiritual eyes spiritual eyes, Heavenly Father, so we can see the blessings that we are getting every day. Father, please continue to give us jobs. Those of us who haven't got jobs, provide jobs, Father. Those of us that are seeking further education, be with us, Lord. Bless the young ones. There are so many students here coming from various countries all around the world, and they've come to us in Leeds. Father, let Leeds be a place, a home for them, a place of comfort, a place of safety, where they will not lose their way. Father, let none of these children that have come to us drift away from you because we failed in our responsibilities towards them. Give us the wisdom, Lord, to keep them, to hold them, to bind them, to support them. Heavenly Father, I pray for all the mothers in the congregation. I pray for all the fathers in the congregation. Heavenly Father, be with us. For those who are not well, heal us physically, Lord, but also heal us spiritually. Father, you see that the world is in turmoil, but Lord, we as a people thank you because we know you are fully in control of everything and we need not fear. You have told us, Lord, when we see these things that we should not fear, we should just look up because our redemption draws near. And Father, as these signs continue to unravel one by one by one, give us that joy, Lord, that Christians should have, that joy of knowing that you are so close, your appearance is so close. Let us be a joyous people, Lord, and continue to praise you, to worship you, to give you the adoration that you need. Father, please be with all the world leaders. Continue to guide them, Lord. Be with the leaders of the church, the r r new body of Seventh-day Adventist leaders that have been put in place. Father, please give them wisdom to guide us, Lord. Give them wisdom to guide us, Lord, I pray. And Father, I pray for Elder Watson, who is going to break the bread of life to us today. Father, you see, he's such an ardent young man. He loves you, Lord, and his greatest desire is to win souls. Heavenly Father, be with him today. Fill him with your spirit, and let only your words 
be spoken by him today. And when those words have been spoken, when your words, Lord, have been spoken by Elder Watson today, may it bless us as a congregation, water our souls. And for those of us who are still in the valley of decision, may something be said today, Lord, that will let us realize that the only thing, the best thing that we can do for ourselves in this life is to surrender to you. So, Heavenly Father, I place every single person in this building in your hand, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Incline thy ears to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. God is good. All the time, that's his nature. The psalmist poses a question. What shall I give unto the Lord for his goodness? And I think that's the question that is posed upon each one of us at this moment. When we return, when we give tithes, we are returning what belongs to him. When we offer offerings, we are showing our appreciation for how good he has been and how good he is and how good he continues to be. So as the deacons and deaconesses serve us and the praise team lead us through that, we can express our appreciation to the goodness of our Lord. Jesus. 
Son did Jesus know by Jesus crucified. Rock and sing sweet, I see, I see, I pledge and know it cleanseth me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for leading us this far. We thank you for protection, for providence, and for all your goodness that we cannot list. And Lord, as we return unto you what belongs to you and give you our tokens of appreciation, we request, Lord, that you accept that which is within our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. It's children's story time now. We're going to have the PA do um, the audio visual. Going to play a video for the children as they come. Children, come down here to the front. All the children, come, come to the front. Sit down on the bench. wait for you all to come and sit down. Any more children I spot? We're really sparse today. In, on the bench, sit on the bench, on the benches. Can you move down? Is it possible you can move down so others can come? Oh no, you can't, all right. Just sit behind, sit on the benches behind, just there on the benches behind. All right, okay, good morning every, good morning children. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I got a reply. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Right. So I need a young man. A young man? Young man, young man. Okay, young man. All right. Come on. I haven't seen you for a while. Come. Come to the front, Michael. Okay. We have our specimen this morning. All right. Now, our children's story this morning is going to be about a particular animal. And I need you to guess the animal. Are you ready? All right, okay. So, this animal exists everywhere in the world, on every continent, except Antarctica. All right, anyone wanna guess what animal it could be? Wildebeest. <laughs> Wildebeest not in this country. Right, let me give you another, another clue, because I know you're inquisitive, and I know you're good investigators. You're gonna ask me the next question, which is, is it a vertebra or an invertebra? And I'm going to say it's an invertebra. Any guesses? Invertebra? Who knows what an invertebra is? Come on, John Natash. John Natash, actually, come, come. You can join Michael, come. What's an invertebra? An invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have any bones. Any backbone? Yeah, brilliant. Well, okay. Any, any guesses for an invertebra? A mini beast. Ooh, he's hot. Oh, you stay up here, Jonatash, with me, right? Right, anyone else? A worm? Uh, no. Come on. Is it a spider? Ooh, very close. Oh, let me give you some more clues. It has six legs. <laughs> tarantula? Ooh, no, tarantula's an um, eight legs, eight legs. Go on. A fly. No, nearly, nearly. Who says six legs fight? Is that Joshua? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three body parts. Come on then. An ant. Someone got it right. It's an ant. It's an ant. All right. An ant is everywhere, isn't it? Ants are all over, outside, everywhere. Right. So, I want, um, since you guys are up here and you're my specimens, can I get you to read Proverbs 6, verse 6 and 7? And John Atash, can you read verse 8? Is that all right? All right. Everyone listen. <laughs> Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no caption, overseer of all that. Provides her with supplies in the summer and gathers food in the harvest. Brilliant. So can you see that the Bible talks about an ant? Right, so... Um, I need you two to be ants, right? So we need, um, what was it now? What was it now? Three body parts, so head, thorax, abdomen, head, thorax, abdomen, check. Um, two antennae, please, young men. Thank you very much. Uh, we've only got uh, two legs, so we just have to pretend that they're six. Okay, now these ants have compound eyes. Compound eyes is very, very um, common in the insect world, but they're very poor compound eyes, so you need to squint like you can't see. Very poor eyesight. Okay, you two, how are you two ants going to communicate? Um, I had a lovely, or um, a lovely mango and I left it upstairs. How are you going to... That's it. That's it. Antler to antler. Go on. Antler to antler. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can go and take a seat. Very good. So did you see that? The ants communicate antler to antler. Now, but the Bible said, was referring to how they find food. Now, how are they, who have got poor eyesight, can only feel their way to each other, how are they gonna find food? Any suggestions? Go on. If they see a human carrying food, if one drops down, they, c they take it. That's a good idea, but unfortunately, they've got really bad eyesight. They can't see humans dropping food. Go ahead. Um, they can feel it. No, 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 no. Go on, Abigail. Uh, the ants can, the ants can feel it, and then they can take it. No, no. All right, one more, one more, one more, and not Bethany. They can sense it. Well, it is a kind of sense. They actually find their way to the food by leaving a scent. What is a scent? Just shout out. What is a scent? They sm right, it's a smell. And what they, the chemical that they leave is in their, they deposit it from their tummy. It's called a pheromone. Can you say the word pheromone? <laughs> right, right. So they go, they find the food, and then on the way back to the nest, they leave like an ant trail, which is like a scent all the way back to the nest. All right, now listen. If the ants are close together, they walk really kind of frantically and randomly, right? because they're, that's an easy way to find food because they've got really bad eyesight. But if the ants are further away from each other and they're foraging for food, they tend to walk in straight lines, okay? And when one finds food, it finds the food. It's like, yeah, I found food. And then it leaves the scent. And the other one smells, oh, that, sounds, that smells like food. So it follows it, it finds the food. Oh yes, I found the food. Great, I'm going to leave a scent for my friend. And it goes back to the nest and it leaves a scent for its friend. And on and on and on and on it goes. This is called, well, we won't go there just yet. All of you guys who are from the Caribbean, who were born in Caribbean or from the African continent, if not you, your parents, everybody knows that if you leave food in the kitchen on the work surface, Adults, what, uh -huh, some people are shaking their head already, like <laughs> someone got taps for that or something, I don't know. But what happens when you leave banana skins, Abigail, on the work surface? Shout out adults, what happens? Yeah, right? There's like a million ants that come and have, for somehow have found the food and they're all crowding around the, 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 um, the, the banana or whatever that's been left. Now that whole loop is a positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop, finding something, then going back to tell someone else. They find it, 
then going back to tell someone else. That is a positive feedback look. And in the Bible, God is saying for us to observe these ants because this positive feedback look, we can, we can um, apply to lots of things. Like how, let me have that because I think we're getting a bit distracted. Both of them, there you go. How we, how we put down habits in our lives For example, you know your parents always say, get up in the morning, pray, then do Bible study, then go back your day, come home and pray. If you keep doing that again and again and again, it becomes a habit, right? And that is such a good habit to have. That's called, another word for that is recruitment. Now, there's a perfect example of the Bible in that, of recruitment. Do you remember there's a woman who was at a well And she asked God for what? Living water. And what did she do? Did she not go back to tell somebody? Who did she go back to tell? Everyone. Yeah, the whole village. And because she told the whole village about the goodness of God, then they got to know Jesus for themselves. Now, children, I'm telling you all this because... BBS is in two weeks' time, not next Monday, the Monday after. And we are going to learn together about something called biomimicry. This is where scientists look and observe in nature, and then they apply certain applications to make our lives easier and better. The, the way that an ant finds food, they've made a logarithm, an algorithm, sorry, for that. And you know when you're searching in your Google search... It's because of ants finding their food. When you've Googled something like Lee Seventh-day Adventist, Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, it comes up at the top because someone else did it, and someone else did it, and someone else did it. That's called a positive feedback. Isn't God amazing that we can observe ants, and then in our Google search, it's because of, our, of ants that we can actually find things in Google. There are so many more examples of God's goodness in biomimicry. All right. For example, I was talking to um, Joshua, Auntie Betty's son, who I don't know. Is he here? Somewhere. We were talking about, is he here? Where, 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 where? Hey, weren't we talking about cameras the other day? Right. The way the camera captures its light is from a moth's eye. We have to thank the moth for that. Right. The way you can be at home, um, you can be, sorry, at work, adults, and you can switch on your central heating from here. We have to thank the bees and how they find their way back to the hive for that. Some of you, like um, Unessa and her husband, have just come back from Jamaica, I right hear. Vitamin C is still glowing on the skin. The way that that, air, that plane found its way back to the UK, we have to fa- thank bats and echolocation for that. Okay? Who made all these things? Ants. Bats, moths, shout out. Right, God is the creator, right? He made all these things. And so we're going to have an exciting time together at VBS, learning about how nature is speaking to us about the goodness of God. That's why our memory text is Romans. Let me just get it really quickly. Romans 1, 19 and 20, which says... Because what, um, what may be known of God is manifested to them, for God has shown it in them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that there is no excuse for not knowing the Lord. Right, children? No excuse. All right, that ends our time together this morning. Can I have a prayer from somebody? Anybody? Come on then, thank you. So if you haven't registered already, get your parents to register. Parents, we want to see your children from the first to the fifth. Gonna have some fun times together. Lots of projects about biomimicry to, to investigate and discover. Everyone, put your hands together, close your eyes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this time we were able to spend together. And please help us to learn more about you when we go to VBS. 
and please help us not to forget what we have learnt. Amen. Amen. Thank you, children. You can go back to your seat. See you for VBS. Happy Sabbath, Church. The scripture reading today is taken from Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. And it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so, it, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Here endeth the reading of God's holy word. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Thank you for the valley that I walk through today. The darker the valley, the more I land to pray. I found you where the lilies bloom by the way. So I thank you for the valley I walk through today. Thank you for every hill I've had and for every time that the sun didn't shine. Thank you for every lonely night. I prayed till I knew everything was all right. And I thank you for the valley I walked through today. Life can't be all sunshine for the flowers who die and the rivers would be desert all barren and dry life can't be all blessings for there would be no need to pray so i thank you for the valley i walked through today thank you for every hill i've had and for every time that the sun didn't shine thank you for every lonely night i prayed till i knew everything was all right and i thank you for the valley i walked through today thank you for every hill i've had and for every time that the sun didn't shine thank you for every lonely night i prayed till i knew everything was all right and i thank you for the valley 
I walked through today. And I thank you for the valley I walked through today. Amen, church. It is a privilege to stand before God's people and to share God's words unto you. I pray that God prepare your hearts as you pray for me because I'm just a vessel. But before I proceed again, I just want to welcome all our visitors and our regular member. I want you to feel at home and be at home. This is your father's house and you are here to hear from the Lord. Now, the scripture reading, it's a personal and a wonderful verse to me because God says in Isaiah 55, just verse 11, God says, when he speak his words, his words will not return unto him void. Let the church say amen. amen. Because the word of God is true. So as I speak before you this morning, church, I'm just bringing a reminder to you the purpose of our calling as a Seventh-day Adventist church. Because sometimes we may forget our purpose. We may forget our mission and forget our calling. And that's what I believe God wants to remind us. Because if you are called to fulfill a purpose and you fail to fulfill that purpose, what reward do you want? So before we proceed, let us have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, I pray that you help me as I stand before your people. I pray, Lord, that you give me the right words to speak. And Father, help all of us, O oh God, to hear our word again. Just a reminder from you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the sermon title is the first sermon, promise and prophecy. And that is taken from Genesis 3, 15. So all we're going to do for the rest of my message is to talk about Genesis 3, 15. Because Genesis 3, 15, it's a promise and also a prophecy. And if you study the Bible carefully and properly, every prophecy must spring from Genesis 3, 15. Everything surrounded that verse. Why? Because that is God's first words in terms of um, a sermon uh, a promise and a prophecy. So I put it on the screen just for you to follow me a bit faster because I'm a person who like to read from the Bible here and there and it may take a little longer for you to find all of these verses but just allow God to speak to our heart this morning. So we're going to turn our Bible to Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3, 15, and it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is what God says to Satan. Church, I want you to follow the word of God. This is what God says to Satan. The first thing God says to Satan is this. I will put enmity between you and the woman. This woman is God's church. And the seeds of this woman, of course, you will see who this seed is, which we already should know. So in this verse, we have the serpent. We have um, the seed of the serpent, which is all the wicked one. Or we could say, in the end, it is the papacy, the beast, whatever you want to call it. We have the woman. And we have the human seed, which is Christ. So when God was speaking to this serpent, God was declaring war to Satan. God was saying to Satan, I'm going to bruise your head. That was what God was saying to serpent. But who was a part of that um, warfare? The church. God going to put enmity. Notice God never said to the serpent, I'm going to bruise your head. God first said, I'm going to put enmity. But look at Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20 says, 
and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be to you. Amen. So Paul is quoting this verse from Genesis 3.15. Who's going to bruise the head of the serpent? The Bible says in Genesis 3.15, it is the seed. Who is the seed? The seed is the weapon of God that God's going to use to break and destroy Satan. But the Bible also says, church, you and I, God's people, God's going to also bruise the head of Satan. Amen? Do you want God to use you to bruise the head of Satan? Yes. But first, we need to understand how this takes place. Now, why did, G why did God speak into, um, to the serpent? There is something that takes place for, for Christ or for God to say these things to the serpent. So I want to do a backdrop of the story, what took place. Now, we know God created Adam, right? God created Adam to be his temple. God created Adam so God can dwell and live in Adam. Now, when Adam sinned, what happened to Adam when he sinned? Adam became carnal. And all humanity, all of God's people became carnal. Adam subject himself to Satan. Now, Adam became desolate, right? Adam lose the presence of God. I want you guys to understand God's word today. Adam lose the presence of God. And when Adam lose the presence of God, Adam is no longer God's temple. Who fit in? Satan. Adam became carnal. And because Adam sinned, all of us became sinners. We have Satan mind. We have the carnal mind. As in Romans chapter 7 verse 14, Paul says, I am carnal soul under sin. Romans 8 verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, a carnal mind is what? Enmity against God and God's law. So Adam in that state, he need a help. Adam and all of us who have Satan mind, we are in captivity to Satan. We are bound and doomed for destruction. If you understand that church, say amen. We are carnal. Imagine, of Satan mind. We hate God's law. That's why in this great controversy, Satan could say to God, your people no longer can keep your law while they have my mind, my carnal mind. Because the Bible said a carnal mind person cannot keep God's law. A carnal mind person is enmity. What does the word enmity really mean? What does the word enmity really mean? It means hatred, hostility, Hatred, God promised, is a prophecy to put enmity between Satan and Christ. God promised is a prophecy to put enmity between Satan and his church. The reason why I want you to understand this church, I don't know if we have that enmity anymore against Satan. But we need to have that enmity in order for us to crush and bruise the head of Satan. Now, we're going to move fast, quickly. This is not working. Let's try it anyway. Now, the seed of God that God going to use to bruise the head of Satan. This is the weapon that God going to use. Now, Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Right? Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Can we turn there please? Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. When you come in the house of the Lord, always bring a Bible. Because that is the only way God going to speak to us. True his words. When I speak to you, my beloved, always go back to the scripture and make sure it is so, just like Iberians. Galatians 3, verse 16. I will paraphrase these verses because of time. That verse is saying to us that Jesus Christ is the seed. Jesus Christ, it is the person God going to use to bruise the head of Satan. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 9. The Bible says Michael is also Christ, as we know. Michael, the Bible says, cast Satan out of heaven, right? And his angel. And there's no more place found in heaven for Satan. Why? Because Jesus, the seed, cast him out of heaven. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3 says, The Lord is the man of what? Anyone there? Exodus, I believe, is chapter 15, verse 3. Says the Lord is what? The Lord is a man of war. Our Savior, the seed, 
He is a man of war. And my beloved, if you understand the scriptures, all I'm trying to do today is to bring a remembrance to you and to show you the calling of this church. Jesus Christ is the seed. God's going to use that seed to bruise the head of Satan. We see the Bible says Jesus is a man of war. And my beloved, Jesus never lose any war. You know, Satan is afraid of Jesus. Because you know the story um, in Egypt when Pharaoh, the Bible says, Pharaoh killed all of the male children. Do you know why he killed all the male children? Because he wanted to prevent the seed from coming to crush his head. Herod, we know Herod, the Bible says, he killed all of these children on the age of two. Why? Because he wanted to stop the seed from coming to crush his head. And Let's back up, church. Now, all through the Bible, as you can see it on the screen, Satan was on Jesus' step over and over. Here, when Jesus came to his church to preach, the Bible says, when he says, the scripture today is fulfilling your hearing, what did the people try to do? Try to cast him over some pit. Right? That's why Satan wants to kill Jesus. Jesus says, I am, me and God is the same. The Bible says they took up stone to cast on Jesus. Everywhere, every step of Jesus, who is the seed, who is going to bruise Satan's head, Satan wants to kill him. But my beloved, the reason why Satan couldn't success in what he wanted to do, because God promised. And when God promised, his word will come to, come to pass. God is faithful, my beloved. Now what that tells me and you, what God says in Genesis 3.15, it will come to pass. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, I will say this before I continue I would encourage our church. When you go to the Bible, God's people should always have the word of God. Bring a notebook. Bring a pen. Take notes. Go back and check and see if it's so. This is the Bereans. We don't want to come to church and just don't have any word. We need to have our sword, my beloved. We are in the last days. We are fighting against the enemy. If we don't have the Bible in our head, we'll be defeated. We need to walk with our sword, my beloved, because... In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says Jesus, I just put that um, phrase in there because it's talking about Jesus. It says Jesus loved righteousness and he hates iniquity. That is the perfect fulfillment of enmity against Satan. Jesus, he hates sin in all its form. Is that so, church? Jesus, he hates sins in all its form. God promised he will put enmity in between Jesus and Satan. God promised he will put enmity between Satan and his church. Think about it. Do we hate sin in all its form? Just think about it. Because if we don't have that experience, we cannot bruise the head of Satan. Now, Jesus came and he died for us. What happened at the cross? Because remember, when Adam sinned, Adam had Satan mind. Adam became carnal. All of us, we are trapped. We are captivity to Satan. So Jesus has to do something. Jesus has to bruise the head of Satan and set us free. Sometimes, church, we don't understand what the cross means to us. Because at the cross, these verses dear to tell us, at the cross, Romans 8 verse 3, the Bible says, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. To do what? To destroy sin in the flesh. That's what God sent his son to do. He sent his son in the flesh just like me and you. But yet he never sinned. Yet Satan tempting, every type of tempting he could think of, but he never sinned. Why, my beloved? Was Jesus different from me and you? Was it not different flesh from me and you? No. The Bible says in Romans 6, verse 6, Knowing this, that your old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin anymore. I know we talk about the cross, right? This old man that controlled our life when Adam sinned. God says in the, his word, at the cross, the old man was what? Sorry? 
Come on, church, talk to me. The old man was what? Crucified. Paul says that henceforth, as from no one, we shouldn't serve sin anymore. Why? Because Christ set us free. And if Christ set us free, church, we are what? We are free indeed. You know, before we go to where I want to go to church, we don't understand the great controversy that God proclaimed in Genesis 3.15. He was talking to Satan and the church have a part to play. But Christ says we are lukewarm. I'm jumping ahead of myself. How can a lukewarm church bruise the head of Satan? Everything we study in the Bible, whether it be the, the Sabbath school lesson, everything springs from Genesis 3.15. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, Knowing this, that our old man, sorry, Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children and partaker of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that of power of death, that is the devil. I give thanks for, to God for Jesus. He's a war. He's a man of war. He never loses a battle. Everything God says about him, it was fulfilled. We see Satan try to stop him. Satan do everything to stop him. Satan could have stopped him in Egypt when he asked, hello, Pharaoh to kill the children. Satan could have stopped him when he was a child with Herod. Satan then turned to the, 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 the church leaders, his own people, to stop him. Nothing can stop Jesus. All because God promised it. God says, whatever I send my word to do, it will not return unto me void. My beloved church, God's going to bruise the head of Satan under your feet, whether you're ready or not. Whether you're ready or not, it has to come to pass. Let me read this quote from Sister White. She explained more what it means to bruise the head of Satan. She says, in Signs of the Times, March 25, 1894, she says, through the very bruising of his heel by Satan, because of affliction, because of affliction and temptation and sorrow, Christ was gaining the victory in behalf of human family. For he triumphed over his enemy. It's not in not healing to his temptation and thus bruise the head of the serpent. So when Satan tempt Jesus Christ, when Satan persecute Jesus Christ, when Satan do all of these things to Jesus Christ, it was bruising the heel of Jesus. Imagine church. If Satan bruised the head of Christ, what will happen to us as human? Salvation would be void. Just think about it. If Satan did bruise the head of Christ, we'll be all be lost. But thank God for Jesus. He stands firm. No matter what Satan showed to him, he never sinned. The Bible said, not even by a thought. Jesus never sinned. That's the only way Jesus could bruise the head of Satan. Because Satan's power is his sin. And if we sin, he has victory over us. But when he tried to tempt Jesus, that's what the Bible said, he was tempted in all temptation, but yet without sin. Jesus couldn't sin, my beloved. You need to understand what it takes, what it means to bruise the head of Satan. I don't think sometimes we understand Sometimes we in the church don't even believe we can have victory over sin. Sometimes we think Christ is powerless to give us victory. When God created us, he created us perfect. And Satan tempted Adam and Eve and caused them to fall and have Satan mindset. If you understand the scripture, my beloved, Romans chapter 7, the Bible talks about a, 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 like a marriage, a husband man. He said in order for you to, to, to marry to someone else, the husband needs to die. Let me tell us something, church. When Adam sinned, Adam was at war or at enmity with God. Adam was in harmony with Satan. Adam and Satan become one. Adam and Satan married. In order for Adam to marry Christ, guess what has to happen? According to the law, according to Romans 7, the husband has to what? Sorry? The husband has to die. And then the wife now, or the woman, can free to marry someone. That's why, my beloved, when Christ died on the cross, that old man was crucified. 
And then the church now is free to remarry Christ. The church now becomes the true temple of God again. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, Do you know you're the temple of God where the Spirit of God dwell? Before all of these things, my beloved, before the cross, we were still the body of sin. Let's put it that way. Because yes, God killed the lamb and closed Adam and Eve. But that was a type. Right? The Bible says killing bulls and goats and sacrifice cannot take away our sin. Can it? No. Yes, it represents Christ, but it cannot take away our sin. It takes Jesus to get a body like this. According to Romans 10, verse 5, I believe, the Bible says, sacrifice and offering, all of these things, it wasn't what God wanted me to do, but he prepared a body that Christ can die and defeat Satan. That body, my beloved, it is the true temple of God. And when we know accept Jesus Christ, we become again the temple of God. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we become the seed of the church, the true church. I just want to remind you what the scripture teaches about salvation. Because sometimes people think, Jesus is going to do everything. But if I put this, I won't read the next slide, you're talking about similar stuff. When Jesus died, we know the story, he went to heaven, and he sent us his Holy Spirit. The Spirit needs a body, and that body is the church, right? Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, Know he are, know he, now you are the body of Christ. And the member particle, Colossians 1, verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The Spirit of God, my beloved, it is the power of God. When Christ came as a man, Christ says numerous times, of my own self, I can't do nothing. It is the God in me or the Spirit of God in me do the work. The power of God, my beloved, it is the Holy Spirit and it is the same power God gave to you and God gave to me. You might say, if I was there when Adam was tempted, I would never sin. I would eat from the tree of life. I mean, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Probably we will say that if we were there. But I'm here to say to you, my beloved, when Christ died on the cross, you are set free so you can choose to do what is right. When Christ died, the old man is crucified. That shackle, that chain is broken, my beloved, and you are free. We don't believe it that we are free. You know, sometimes we come to church, we sing song. We do, like this morning, my elder, we're talking about the, the ten virgin. We come to church. Five was wise, five was foolish. I'm an elder in the church. I pay my tithes on all of these things. That won't guarantee me salvation. We need to be the temple of God. Because, my beloved, if you're going to the sanctuary, when Christ died at the cross, that was the first phase of the plan of salvation. Not the last, it was the first phase. When Christ crushed the head of Satan, Christ have to do that. He have to break the, the, the captivity. He have to break that carnal mind and set us free and shed his blood to give us the power so we can be free from sin. Now, let's move on, church. As you can see on the screen, that quote says in second selected message, page 102, 106, paragraph 2, it says, the message proclaimed by the angel fly in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel. The same gospel that was declared in heathen when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise her head and thou shalt bruise his heel. In the beginning, my beloved, Genesis 3.15 is the gospel. But the gospel, it goes all the way into the most holy place. We have Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. That's where the work is going to finish. As you can see on the screen, it is the third phase of the plan of salvation. That's where God's people come in, my beloved. That's where seven-day Adventist was born. 
I don't, under, I don't think you understand where does we come from. Do you know, if you go back here, if you go back here, my beloved, come on, where I want to go? I want to wrap up quickly. Oh. I even skipped this one. This is what happened when Christ died, when he came and lived. Do you know that the salvation of mankind wasn't the primary reason? Do you know that? That was the second reason. The primary reason why Christ came and lived a perfect life and died is for this reason. He says, but the plan of redemption had, had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. What is that purpose? It says, it was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitant of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. But it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. That is the main purpose why Christ came to die. Because if you know the great controversy, Satan in heaven, before he came to earth, he was accusing God that God is not fair. He was accusing God. Satan had the privilege to go to all the unfallen world to tell him about the unrighteousness of God. And God allowed Satan to continue for a while to allow everyone to see that God is just, true, and faithful. So Christ has come down in this great controversy. No matter what Satan do, does Christ came into, into his world because the Bible says Satan is a god of this world. Christ came into his world and destroyed Satan. Amen, church. Christ is all we need. We must believe it that through Christ we can have victory. Not some sins, my beloved. Every sin. But believe it or not, the plan of salvation what God did in, um, in, the, in, in the beginning, he's going to restore God's people to that state. Look at the, the universe. Do you know big universes? Universes, if you see there, as I was reading, it says, the deeper we look into the cosmos, the more galaxy we see. In 2016, it's just to say that our universe, these galaxies, there are two trillion or two million million galaxies in the universe. So this little earth where Christ came and died for is not only for us, but it's for the whole universe. God has to vindicate his name. And sometimes we just get so caught up to think it's just us alone. Look at this. You can't even see the earth in the universe. But that tells me and you how much God value us. How God care for us. He could come and die for us. The church. Christ is the head of the church. Christ has a perfect hatred for sin in all its form. What about the church? Do we have the same hatred against Satan? Do you know what happened in the, in the third phase in the sanctuary, in the most holy place? What happened in the most holy place? In Leviticus 16 verse 30, the Bible says, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that he may be clean from all your sin before the Lord. On the day of atonement, my beloved, God's going to clean you and cleanse you from all your sin. That's what the Bible says. But if you look in Daniel 8:14, it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then this sanctuary will be cleansed. Now that word cleanse, my beloved, follow me. That word cleanse, it's a different word from Leviticus 16 verse 30. That word cleanse means to justify, to restore, to declare righteous, to vindicate. Who needs to be vindicated in the sanctuary? What is in the sanctuary that needs to be cleansed? What is in the sanctuary need to be vindicated? 1844, we as Adventists believe that's where Christ moved into the most unholy place. That's where the church was born. What was the purpose of this church? The purpose of our church, my beloved, it is to vindicate God's name before the universe. Do you know that? Do we know that? The purpose of this church, we never born in the, the courtyard, in the outer court. We never born in the, the holy place. That was the time of the Christian church. This church was raised up 
for one purpose and one purpose only. Apart from proclaiming the everlasting gospel, this church and this church God is going to use to bruise the head of Satan. This church God is going to use to vindicate his name before the universe. How can we vindicate God's name while we defiling his name by sinning? Why does this sanctuary need to be cleansed, to be restored, to be vindicated? If you look in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 3, the Bible says this, And I will set my face against man, and I will cut him off from among his people, because he has given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to proclaim my holy name. 2 Corinthians 20, verse 8 and 9 says, And they dwell therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for my name saying, if when evil come unto us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help us. When we sin, my beloved, we defile or pollute God's name in his sanctuary, because God's name as the Bible, is rep represent God's character. When we sin, we defile and pollute God's character. In order for the sanctuary to be cleansed, in order for God's name to be purified, what God's people need to do? When God's people stop sending their sin into the sanctuary, then God's name into the sanctuary will be cleansed to be restored, to be justified, and to be vindicated before the universe. My beloved, God's people need to be sinless in order for the head of Satan to be crushed. Let me ask this question. In the type, in the Day of Atonement, right? We know the Day of Atonement, right? What condition God's people were in on the Day of Atonement? I'm talking about the type. I'm closing. Anyone want to answer? What condition was God's people on the day of atonement? Sorry? Anyone? They were without sin. Do you think on the day of atonement you can still have sin in you or still practicing sin? The Bible said you'll be cut off. That is a type, my beloved. That is a type. The anti-type is when God moved into the most holy place in 1844. I know sometimes we're scared, we are fearful to understand that Christ is powerful to set us free from all our sin. Sometimes we are fearful to say God can make us sinless. The, the Israelites in the past, do you know when the high priest go into the most holy place, they were without sin, waiting for the high priest to come. God is calling us and telling us, thank you, God is calling us and telling us that Genesis 3.15, even though Christ bruised the head of Satan at the cross, it is to set us free, give us the power of Christ, so Christ, notice, not us, but the Bible says God is going to crush. It is God in us, my beloved, going to bruise the head of Satan. And if God in us, as though God was in Christ, allow Christ to live a victorious life, we today in the church, we can. That's what God wants to remind you, my beloved. You know, we come to church and we do all of these things. But I'm here to say to you, if you don't crush or bruise the head of Satan, Satan's going to bruise your head. Is he the rider? Revelation, 17, Revelation 12, verse 17. The Bible says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There, notice, Satan and his angel can bruise only the heel. In the very act when Satan seemed to have triumphed, putting them, which is the remnant, to torture and death, the faithful who stand in defense of the Lord of Jehovah was wounded the head of great rebel, the Satan. When we stand faithful to the law of God, when we stand faithful to the truth of God, we will bruise the head of Satan. 
Just like Jesus Christ, my beloved, he's the head of the church. He set an example. The reason why, the reason why God first said to the seed, you have to bruise the head of Satan, then the church, because we were crippled. We have the mind of Satan. So Christ has to come first and destroy that mind. Then we can have power from God, which is the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, we then can bruise the head of Satan. This power in the word of God. There is power through the Holy Spirit, my beloved. You have good over evil. The only power in heaven that can destroy the power of Satan. It is God. And the Holy Spirit, it is God in you. Why are we still failing? Why are we making Satan defeating us over and over? And the scripture says, God promise. God promise cannot return unto him void, my beloved. And if you cannot bruise Satan head under your feet, God is going to have a group of people. That's why we have the wise and the, and the tears. We have the, we, we have the foolish and the wise. We have the wheat and the tears. God of a people. This is God's people. We know the story. God is going to separate those who don't want to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit and those who do. I, I need to use this. Look at this one. It says... Register in the history of nation, Josh Huss, lives. His godly work and steadfast faith is pure, pure life, and conscious, cons, conscientious, following of the truth that was unfolded to him. These we would not yield even to be saved a cruel death. All heaven witnessed that triumphant death by the whole universe. Satan was bruised, the heel of the seed of the woman, but in the act of Huss, his head was bruised. No matter what Satan did, Huss was stand faithful to God. No matter how much Satan cast temptation upon us, if we fell in that temptation, Satan is bruising our head. Do you get it, church? When we fall into Satan's temptation, he is bruising our head because sin is his power. And we are saying to Satan, yes, I know we have the power of God, but you're more powerful. Yes, we have a weakness body. But it's no excuse for us to sin, my beloved. Because Christ came to sinful flesh just like me and you, but he never sinned. Then what is the problem? What is the problem? Do we have an enmity against Satan? Do we love Satan's schemes? Do we love Satan stuff? You know, on the Day of Atonement, there was four things God asked his people to do. Four things. The first one was, we must have a holy convocation around this sanctuary. Where were these priests? In the most, most holy place. What were they doing on that day? The Bible says, they were afflicting their soul. The Bible says, if anyone don't afflict their soul, they should be what? Cut off. That's what God says. That's what God says, not me. Because chapter 23, verse 29, it says, For whosoever soul it is that shall not afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from amongst my people. This is the type. We're coming to the antitype, if we can. The next thing God says, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. We can find that for our time, Romans 12, verse 1, where the Bible says we must present our body as a living sacrifice on that day. In this time that we live in, my beloved. And the Bible says, he shall do no work on that same day. Our work, my beloved, it's sinful. Philippians 2 verse 13, I believe, it, says, it is God who wants to work in us. On this day, oh God, my brethren, on the day of atonement, God wants to take control of your life. Now, we're going to look on the day of um, afflicting your soul. Quickly, as we close. In Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible says this, Then I proclaim a what? A fast there, at the river of Hava, that we might afflict ourselves before our Lord, to seek him a right way for us, and for a little one, and for all our substance. I, um, Isaiah 58, verse 5 says, It is such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul. So we see afflicting your soul is connected with fasting. Fasting. But here what Sister White says the true fasting is.
May God help us. She says, the true fasting which should be recommended to all is to abstinence from every stimulating kind of food and the proper use of wholesome, simple food which God has provided in abundance. You know, the, 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 the simple food, you know, the, what God provides in abundance in Genesis chapter 1? Fruits and vegetables. Let me, let me back up. Let me back up, church. Do you know, when Adam sinned, it was through, it was through appetite. It was through eating, right? Yes? Yes? Adam fell because of food. Do you know, the second Adam Christ, he begins where Adam fell. In the wilderness when satan comes to him and says turn this stone into bread christ give us victory over appetite where adam fall believe it or not my beloved in the day in the most holy place where we were born our first work is to afflict our soul our first work is to have victory over sin our first work is to be temperate over appetite my beloved i don't have to ask any question but are we struggling with appetite are we intemperate are we so fainting as what christ says overeating god is bringing us to remembrance my beloved we can't be in this condition and yet receive the blessing of the high priest are we afflicting our soul our mind is around the most holy place or are we thinking about television are we thinking about closing? Are we thinking about our mobile phone? Are we thinking about our work? Are we thinking about the things of the world? This is what Satan uses to trap, to trap his people, God's people. The things of the world, my beloved, we love these things. But God promised to put enmity between his church and Satan. God is calling us to repent. We need to repent because we are lukewarm. And I love this definition of repentance. I love it. Sister White says, repentance for sin is the first step in conversion. Repentance is an intense hatred of sin in all its form. Do you understand what repentance means, church? It is to have an intense hatred of sin in all its form. I don't know if you have that experience. That's what it means to have enmity against Satan. I'm closing with these two. You know, it's working. But I will say this, church. In Genesis 3.15, God called his church to bruise the head of Satan. We need not to forget God's promise in that verse about the enmity he's going to put between the church and Satan. Sometimes it seems like we are harmony with, with Satan. Sometimes Satan can, can tempt our ministers to water down the gospel. Sometimes Satan can bring message that make us happy. We need to understand church, we are at war. This church is at war. It's not a play fun thing. Satan knows that he at war with us and he's not happy with us. Satan is looking for people to surrender their heart to Christ. Christ, the seed of the woman, is the head, and all who are in Christ are his body. He and they are the one seed. In these words, the Lord set the church which continue to this day, a seed which is opposed to Satan and to evil, a seed which remain by the power of the Spirit of God, waging constant war with the power of evil. Do we belong to that seed? In this seed, there is a deep-seated hatred to everything that is false and evil. God will see that this seed, the remnant seed, shall never yield to the power of evil, for still it shall stand true to the promise he made in Genesis 3.15. We need to understand that's what God called us for, the remnant church. 
the Seventh-day Adventist church, is not to play game, is not to love evil, to love to, to parlor with the enemy. But I will close with this encouraging words. So I can't find these encouraging words. This is a quote I will close with. The soul that he led to Christ become his own fortress, which he hold in a revolt world. And he intend that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assault of Satan. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. We must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. It is not necessary for us deliberately to choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under his dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. I think somebody chopped off a piece of my slide. <laughs> but in other words, in other words, God is saying, unless we surrender totally to Christ. Okay, they get it back. It says, if we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. The only defense against the evil is the abide, is to dwell of Christ in the heart through faith of his righteousness. Unless we become vital, unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effect of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off many bad habits for the time we may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continually communion with all, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. My beloved, we are at war with the enemy. God's church, this church, was raised up in 1844 to clear God's name before the universe. Because the Bible says, until two to three days, we know it very well. Christ, or we could say God's sanctuary, will be cleansed. That's where God's name is. Our sin, when we sin today or tomorrow, it defiles God's name in the sanctuary. We cannot bruise the head of Satan while we still have sin in our life. Christ never did it. So why do we think we can do it? When Christ set an example for us to follow. Church, we are at war. We are going home. The war is getting hotter and hotter. But we don't need to care to think so much about the war. Only thing we need to do is to connect our life to Jesus. Moment by moment. Forget about Arsenal match. Let me tell you something, church. If Christ was here, will he have time to watch Arsenal Manchester? Answer me. No. Why? Sometimes we think we, we don't understand the warfare we're in. The clothes we buy, the, 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 the movie we watch. But yet, we want to bruise the head of Satan. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, church, in the, most, in the most holy place, there's certain things cannot take place there. We should know these things. Certain, I have to tell you the truth. Certain dressing cannot take place in there. You cannot bring jewelry in there. You cannot eat certain food in there. We can't. But we today think we can. All because we don't understand, my beloved. God is pleading with you today that according to Genesis 3.15, his promise will not return unto him void. If you're not going to be a part of God's faithful remnant church, to bruise the head of Satan, you will be cut off. 
And that is the truth in the scripture. But God is saying this today, my beloved. If I overcome the world, be of good cheers because you can overcome. May God help us. There's so much I want to say. We are called to vindicate God's name before the universe, not just before us, but before all the unfallen world because they're watching to see if God is true. You know, through Job, God could do it. Through Daniel, God could do it. Through Joseph, God could do it. But God needs to have a church, a whole generation of faithful people to stand faithfully to him. And these people... Through the judgment of us, my beloved, where God is separating two groups, the wise and the foolish, because the Bible says God will separate these groups, my beloved. May God help us to be on the right side. Let us, God, give us power to put away things of the world. All what Satan is doing through Revelation 13, the beast and the mark of the beast and all of these things, all of these things, my beloved, is to cause us to fall. This temptation, when you come by yourself, is to call us to fall. The Bible says all nations will be against you. There's about 200 nations in the world. All of them are going to be against you for Christ's name's sake because Satan wants you to fall. The Bible says all your families, your friends, your brothers, your mother and sister are going to be against you because Satan wants you to fall. That's the only reason. But through Christ, we can stand victorious. May God help us. In these last days. I'd like to thank the elder for the timely message. Amen. Amen. As our praise and worship team come forward to close our worship with song number 294, Power in the Blood. Almighty God, we thank you for that power which is available even now unto us. 
O oh God, help us, Lord, to understand our calling and help us, Lord, to understand your promise will never return unto you void. But, Father, we know you are a faithful God. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful like Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, for that power because we know, Lord, through him we can be more than conqueror. So thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our extract will be number 183. I will sing of Jesus' love. Praise my heart, shall. 